Good morning. Great to be back in New Zealand. Uh, let's see. Uh, last Thursday, I stopped working on graphics. <laughs> Finally, it's done. Finally, <laughs> it's done. Yeah. But I have a bunch of stuff from last year, and actually, of course, uh, my minion army will continue to produce new graphics excitements over the coming years. So nothing will slow down in my absence. Um, I wanted to talk to you about some work that I actually did last work uh, last year um, on uh, drawing 2D graphics with uh, OpenGL, um, uh, a, a system that uh, Eric Anholt started um, a long time ago. Uh, in 2004, I did a bunch of presentations, one of them at OLS uh, called Getting X Off the Hardware. Uh, it's only 11 years later. Uh, we're making good progress. Um, so that speech talked about doing 2D drawing with OpenGL, it talked about hardware independent X drivers, and it talked about um, how we were moving from a land in which you wrote a lot of custom per, um, per hardware, per chip, and per input system code for X, and moving to a world where we're writing a lot more uh, externalized uh, functionality in terms of using GL for rendering and using EVDev for input. And X was going to become much like it was back in the 90s. You know, we're basically, okay, I live in Portland. Everybody goes to Portland to revisit the 90s, and X is no exception. We're going back to a world where we have kernel-based uh, drivers for graphics and uh, fairly simple rendering infrastructure. I wanted to talk also about uh, uh, hardware independent X drivers and uh, how we're getting rid of the, the video, the mode setting stuff um, uh, from X drivers and how I've been doing, how I've accelerated uh, rendering uh, uh, development uh, using an X on X solution called Zephyr. Okay, Glamour is uh, GL based X acceleration. It was started by Eric in uh, 2008, it turns out. Um, in 2008, uh, Mesa kind of wasn't as good as it is today. It had support for a slightly older version of the GL standard. It had some sluggish areas in vertex shading on most of the hardware we had then. Um, as a result, Glamour was really targeting a very different world. And in the ensuing six years, we've really made enough changes in the GL world that it was really time to revisit Glamour and try to figure out how we wanted to support 2D graphics using GL today, in particular on Mesa. Um, I don't test on anything other than free software, of course. Um, and so I really have no idea how well Glamour works on non-free software, and I really don't care. Um, a brief overview of GL, and I'm sure Ian will laugh at this. Uh, GL is, is basically does four things. Uh, GL has vertex shaders that you write, little programs that you write in GLSL, uh, that give a pile of input data, whatever input data you want, and they compute triangle or um, rectangle coordinates uh, for both the source and destination of your, um, uh, of your blitz or whatever uh, painting you're doing. <clears throat> and then there's a bit of hardware in the, in the, in the, um, in the system that takes those coordinates for the uh, primitive and kind of interpolates the values across the primitive. Uh, so if you have source coordinates and destination coordinates, it'll interpolate them so you have, uh, for each destination pixel, you know the address of the source pixel to, draw, to, to fetch from. Um, and then you have another piece of code that you get to write called a fragment shader. And so the fragment shader is given all these interpolated coordinates and it goes and fetches whatever data it needs to get from various pieces and computes a uh, destination pixel value operand, which is an RGBA value. And then you throw that hardware, throw that RGBA value at a, another piece of hardware and it actually draws that pixel to the frame buffer. That's GL in four bullet items. Did I miss anything? No, my fragment shader does not do interpolation. A real hardware apparently has put the interpolation into the fragment shader because that way you can do nonlinear interpolation, I'm sure. Okay. That's what GL makes it look like in any case. Um, here's, here's a short slide on what X rendering looks like. Um, X has a bunch of geometric primitives. You have uh, rectangles, text, lines, polygons. Um, the X server breaks some of the more complicated primitives down into little spans, which is just a horizontal chunk of uh, pixels, a single line, you know, 10 or 20 pixels long. So if you have some complicated polygon, it actually cracks that polygon and, these, and, and hands your driver these, these little spans. 
Um, that was awesome in 1986 because no, none of the render had polygon rasterization, so doing it in uh, software and having all the drivers do something simple was awesome. Um, there's also more complicated primitives, arcs, wide lines, field arcs, polygons. Um, we don't use these anymore, uh, so we really don't care. X drawing has a fill style. Uh, every X primitive is, is either filled with a solid color uh, 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 or a regular pattern, either a tile, which is a multicolor uh, pattern, or a stipple, which is a two color pattern. And why there are two different kinds? Well, yeah. Welcome to 1980. Um, there's a raster operation. Uh, these are bitwise Boolean operations. Um, back in, 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 the, in the small talk era, this was kind of awesome because people thought that these 16 operations would like uh, cover all of the possible things you'd ever want to do with rendering on the screen. Um, two of them are useful, copy and clear? Copy. <laughs> One of them is useful. <laughs> They're completely irrelevant today. Uh, it's okay, GL supports them. Uh, the other thing that we used to do is we used to do crazy tricks with our, um, with our color maps. The hardware used to have a mapping between the pixel value and the RGB value that would appear on the screen. You'd crack these pixels up, these pixels up into a collection of modifiable ones and non-modifiable ones, and you'd have this plain mask thing which would say, uh, don't draw to those two bits of the frame buffer. Yeah, the other six ones, yeah, draw those. But those, just leave them whatever value they were. Um, yeah, we don't use those today. <laughs> and the last thing that X-Core rendering has a, is a dash pattern. GL also has dashed lines. Um, GL dashed lines, there's like eight different dash line patterns. If you, it's, you know, if you like one of those eight patterns, it's awesome. If you wanted something different, yeah, you can't use that. Uh, X dash patterns are way overspecified. X dash patterns is an arbitrarily long list of lengths of dashes at eight bits per length. So you could have a thousand element dash pattern. It was like you know one, two, maybe maybe the value of pi encoded in pixel lengths. Yeah. It's uh, kind of silly. Uh, Glamour last year, uh, before we got started kind of rewriting it for the modern world, uh, Glamour had a couple of fixed GLSL programs um, f to do some of the, some of the low-level rendering. It, was, it didn't actually, um, it didn't actually d cover the entire X spec, though. Um, all of the coordinates in Glamour were computed on the CPU. Here I have this massively parallel VLIW machine that does floating point operations in the blink of an eye. And I compute everything with a CPU <laughs> because, God forbid, I should ask the GPU to add or multiply numbers. Um, the tiles and stipples, these repeating patterns that X uses all the time, they were actually repeated mechanically on the CPU to actually fill multiple rectangles uh, to do tiling. Um, a lot of the time, Glamour would just throw up its hands, yeah, I don't know how to do this X operation. I'm going to just let the CPU handle this. And so the uh, Glamour would actually pull the image out of the frame buffer back to main memory paint on it carefully with the CPU, and then push it back into the frame buffer. Um, for some things, it was fine. If you were running Xterm from 1986, it worked great. <laughs> if you're running a compositing window manager, it kind of sucked. Uh, let's see, my Glamour plan was to move all the computation to the GPU. It's like the CPU, yeah, we have a CPU. I think most of us would prefer to be using our CPU to be running Emacs, um, instead of running my uh, tiling computations. Uh, so the plan was to just dump raw X coordinates in integer form right at the GPU and let the GPU deal with everything. No fallbacks at all. There were, you would never use the CPU for drawing anything. Um, and the way that I was going to uh, avoid this, the common, you saw the combination of rendering operations in X, the way that I was going to avoid a combinatorial explosion of GLSL uh, was by templating my GLSL construction and kind of gluing bits together. And I'll show you how that works. Uh, here's how you construct, here's how I construct GLSL programs. I break the GLSL program into a bunch of little facets. Uh, each facet has um, a, a collection of declarations, a little chunk of code, and a selection of variable values that it's getting from the external world. So you, you'd, uh, the facet, each facet declares these three little pieces. Um, each, of the, each of the vertex and fragment shaders have these little templates that are just basically sprintf strings with percent %s's uh, for the declarations, each set of declarations and each set of code. Uh, there's a geometry primitive facet, so if you want to draw lines, you have a little facet for drawing lines. It tells it how to get x coordinates and construct, uh, construct lines uh, in GL land. There's a fill style facet. 
And then I build the GLSL programs that I need on the fly as you're executing X. So when you first start up X, if you don't draw anything, you don't compile any GLSL. Um, if you start drawing crazy stuff, you'll get a couple of facets. And if you draw all the operations, like you're running some benchmark, uh, you compile all of, these, all of these programs, which works fine. Uh, here, here is, I, I'm, I know I'm putting code up on the screen, I'm really sorry. Um, this is, a, this is a, uh, uh, the facet that draws rectangles with GLSL 1.30. It has, um, it has a little uh, variable, a little, the, the primitive that's coming in from the application, an attribute. And it has this little thing which computes the position on the line by basically multiplying and scaling the line from an integer to an appropriate uh, floating point value. Um, pretty, simple fa pretty simple primitive. Uh, you notice my GLSO programs are huge. This one is what, uh, two lines of uh, executable code? I'll show you what it generates. Here's the solid fill facet. This one's really hard. Yeah, here, here's, here's the line of code here. Can I get my cursor over there? Probably. Uh, yeah, not so much. There it is. Yeah, the, the line of code here. Yeah, it stores a solid color on the screen. Yeah. This, this actually turns out to be it's interesting. Um, this turns out to be slower than fetching, fetching tile, uh, tile values from a texture. I think it's like GL's like, wait a minute, that's not complicated enough for me. Um, you get penalized because your program is too simple. We're going to slow you down, you know. Uh, so this is this is uh, what I compute as a result. Here's the uh, the uh, vertex shader, uh, which fetches the the, the vertexes from in, from X format and computes the the two coordinates. I'm actually using instancing uh, GL instancing for this so that I actually dump um, X Y. Um, uh, X and Y values for the two endpoints that I compute the. Uh, why am I using instancing for this? This seems crazy. Less vertex data. Less vertex data. That's right. Yeah. Any case, uh, this computes uh, the, the GL position X, Y, Z, W. Oddly, um, I'm doing 2D graphics, and GL has these other dimension that I don't understand. Um, so you see a lot of times when I'm setting the Z value to some constant, and I pick zero. I don't know if zero is a good Z value. Maybe one is better? They're all nice Z values. Yeah. It's like living in flatland. It's like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. here's, the, here's the fragment shader. Um, there is the, the line of code. There's a foreground color coming in. Uh, so one of the questions I have is it, I'm, I have this uniform, and GL has these uniforms. That's the value the program sets. It's the same for all the, all the executions of this uh, primitive. Uniforms seem to me to be expensive in most GL drivers. I could set it as a vertex attribute. Would that be better? I don't know. Um, here's the adventures of what I had to do to get Cortex running. Uh, Cortex is crazy stuff. Um, it's all encoding dependent. Do you remember non-Unicode encodings? Like when you're running an MS-DOS machine and your quotes and your, uh, and your uh, smart quotes do start putting weird punctuation on the screen? Yeah, well, that Cortex lives in that world. Uh, nobody uses this stuff anymore, uh, but we get benchmarked on it. And as I said, one of the goals was to have no fallbacks. Uh, so I tried to do this as simply as possible. And what I do is I actually dump the entire font in one enormous texture on the screen. But I actually store it in one bit per pixel in an 8-bit byte. And so my fragment shader actually has to pull out a byte, an appropriate byte from the uh, texture, and shift in mask to pull out the bit. Uh, yeah, if you don't have integer operations in your GL library, this is not going to work. Eric, do you have integers that can do this on VC4? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Integers are good. What doesn't have integers these days, Early? Uh, R300. R300. OK. Molly does? Oh, OK. Not doing well? Divide, divide is bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. OK. Uh, OK, line dashing, I talked about this a bit. Uh, uh, GL supports only a few fixed dash patterns. So it's like, uh, yeah, I just can't use that at all. Um, X has this unlimited length. I think I want to try encoding like three or four hundred digits of pi in, the, in a dash pattern and see if this works. That'd be kind of fun. Oh, I could do the Debian Tartan 
with dash patterns in a wide line. Oh. <laughs> um, so what I do for this is I actually store the dash pattern in a texture, because GL loves textures. I just paint it with X commands into a texture. And then I just fetch one pixel per dash element um, and figure out whether the pixel needs to be on or off. Uh, the vertex shader has to compute the appropriate start coordinate within the texture uh, to figure out where to start the dash pattern. And then it needs to figure if the line is more vertical or more horizontal to figure out which way to interpolate, whether you're interpolating along X or just along Y. Because the dash patterns are actually per pixel. Um, so it's a little bit of computation in the vertex shader. And the fragment shader is really simple. It's like, uh, here's my interpolated dash position. Fetch the pixel. Is it a 1 or a 0? Oh, look, it's a 1. I'll paint the foreground color. Um, that actually goes really fast as a result. So here's what I accelerate these days in core operations. I accelerate filled rectangles, oddly. Uh, filled spans, which is used for all those legacy, grotty old X crazy graphic stuff. Uh, copy area. Uh, here's an interesting problem. So copy area is an X operation which is well defined when you have an overlapping operation. X says you can do overlapping copies and they work. GL in its infinite wisdom decided to say that, oh, if you do overlapping copy operations, you could just light the GPU on fire. It's completely undefined. Don't ever do that. Um, and I thought, oh my god, when I was doing the initial development, I'm going to have to find some way to use the old pieces of the hardware in my GPU to do copy area because it, could, it would be horrific to make a temporary intermediate copy of the pixels while doing the copy area, right? So I spent a bunch of time and wrote a bunch of code and used the GL legacy path to get at the old legacy 2D blitter, blitter in my Intel chip and it worked and it was the same speed as my old 2D code and my 2D acceleration stuff and I said, good to go. And then somebody said, um, yeah, but your GPU has those, and they work correctly. But if you actually read the GL spec, those are also undefined. So you can't actually use those. <sighs> Fine. Went back and rewrote it to use a temporary pix map, copy the bits from the, pic, from the source to a temporary, copy the bits from the temporary back to the bitmap. And it was uh, faster than the... <laughs> old hardware. Yeah, question? Do you have to do that if the two areas don't overlap? So the question is, do you have to do that if the two areas don't overlap? And the answer is, I don't. No, and we do check. What? No, and we do check. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't, we don't, have, to, we don't have to do that if the oh, areas don't overlap, and we do check. But most of the time, so an overlapping copy area is something you do when you scroll your terminal. You hit return at the terminal, it scrolls up. Or when you take a window and slide it around the screen. So if you're doing copies from one pix map to itself, they're effectively always overlapping because those are the only interesting copies. Hmm? Is it? Oh no no, it's the Nvi there's an Nvidia extension that you can tell it. Yes. Yeah. So there is an in so if the operations are not overlapping, then you can use a magic Nvidia extension and say, "Hey, I promise to not have overlapping operations." Can you make sure that things work when I do the copy between the uh, object and itself? And there's an NVIDIA extension that most of our drivers support, and it does a bunch of serialization and synchronization of the hardware to make sure it's actually going to work. So that, yes, you can actually do that. Yeah. That was six months ago. Thanks, Eric. Um, I also accelerated an X operation called copy plane that no application uses anymore. <laughs> Yeah, actually I only accelerate one of those directions and the other ones. So you, can, so you have two drawables and you want to pull out, so you want to slice your source and pick out just one bit from every pixel and then use that to paint the destination. Well, so you could do this from deep drawables or shallow drawables. So you could do it with a one-bit source or an n-bit source. Well, GL doesn't do this one-bit stuff. And so right now I'm doing all the one-bit operations with, uh, with software. Uh, which kind of sucks, but nobody uses one bit very much anymore. Which means that in the copy plane, when doing a one to n, it's actually kind of like a put image. So it actually works okay, but it's not really accelerated. Uh, the other thing that I accelerated, and in fact, the first thing that I accelerated was dots. Now, dots are, are an interesting operation, not because applications use them, but because they paint just a single pixel and they take an xy coordinate. 
So there's this huge amount of data flow that you have to get from your application all the way to the rendering engine. And in every other acceleration architecture I've ever built, literally, dots turned out to be way faster in software than they were in hardware. Because one of the things you have to do to draw a dot is you have to see if it's clipped or not. So you have a window, you want to know if your dot is in the window or not. And that was a very expensive computation. Well, it turns out that my GL hardware does clipping. And so that expense that was usual for acceleration paths went away. Uh, the other thing is you had to compute the address within the frame buffer given this XY coordinate. And I used to have to do that in software before I loaded it into my accelerator. GL can do the coordinate transformation for me and save me that computation. So that cost from the old acceleration architectures were gone. So I was like, hmm, I wonder if this is actually going to be faster now. Because I was expecting it to be a little slower, a lot slower, egregiously slow, slow to the point that I would consider using a fallback. But it turns out that because GL is actually a competent graphics API and does all the things that you actually need graphics to do, I'm able to take the coordinates that the application gives me and mem copy them to the GPU and say, go. And if you draw a lot of dots, like a thousand at a time, it's actually frighteningly fast. And this operation turned out to run at like 200 or 300 million dots per, no, it was, I don't know what it was. It was an insanely large number. Well, I can find out in a minute. We'll do some t uh, demos here in a second. Uh, the other thing that GL does is it draws lines. Who do? Uh, GL, of course, was started in an era when wireframe graphics was interesting, and people did a lot of wireframe stuff because our GPUs couldn't do polygons fast enough. Um, and as a result, GL has fairly competent lines. It doesn't have dashed lines that I liked, but we could work around that in our fragment shader. And so I accelerate thin lines, and they are frighteningly fast as well. Now, the one benchmark that you might see that draws lines is GTK perf. Uh, GTK perf draws one line per color, and then switches colors and draws another line. So GTK perf, it's not horrible, but GTK perf isn't scary fast. And I'll show you X11 perf, which draws a thousand lines of the same color, and it goes really fast. And then, of course, I accelerate the text we talked about before. So interesting results. Uh, solid tile and stippled all run at about the same speed. Actually, tiled runs the fastest, and I really don't know why. Uh, tiled actually has to fetch uh, texture values for every, every destination pixel that it's drawing, and yet it seems to consistently run about 5% faster than solid, which uses one color for everything. <laughs> I'd love to know why. Um, the really awesome part is that Glamour accelerates all these corner cases that we've ignored for years and years and years with no effort at all. So all these operations like, oh, I have this 15 by 17 stipple with, a, you know, with this weird raster up. Uh, before, we would have said, yeah, throw up your hands. It's going to go really slow. I'm so sorry. I don't want to spend my life writing every special case. With Glamour, because I'm able to use GLSL in this combinatorial way and kind of dynamically program the thing, every operation runs as fast as it possibly can. So there's just literally no special cases anymore. So everything goes at hardware speed. <clears throat> the other thing I learned was having written a lot of assembly language code for my Intel GPU, um, writing it in a high-level language is <laughs> way better. Never going back. Yeah. Who remembers writing assembly code on, you know, like your favorite microcontroller? Yeah. Who remembers the day you got to use a real language? And yeah, yeah. Ever going back to writing thousands of lines of 8051 assembly code? No, never doing that. So the, that's the, the main thing I learned there was that A, it's easier to write, and B, because it's easier to write, I'm not afraid to do hard things in it. Right? So this crazy bitmap te uh, text, text fetching stuff that would have been really complicated in, in assembly language, and in fact generates a lot of assembly language code, that would have been frightening for me to actually try to deliver a reliable version of that um, and have to keep rewriting it for every new GPU generation. The advantage of using the high-level language is, poof, it all just happens. Um, here are some performance results. This may be a little hard for you to read. This is actually every X11 perf uh, test, and it's run on both um, uh, Glamour and the, uh, the two Intel acceleration architectures, SNA and UXA. Uh, what it is is a log scale plot with uh, the one running right down the middle. So uh, lines pointing to the, to the right are where Glamour is faster, and lines pointing to the left 
are where uh, one of the acceleration architectures is faster. And I think you see a kind of a, a fairly good pattern here where Glamour is doing better on most operations. Uh, but there are still some standouts on the other side, and I'll discuss those in a second. Uh, this is, uh, I pulled this SVG out of a, of a, a web posting I did about, what, nine months ago? Six months ago? Um, and you can actually read it there. It's kind of big. Some people complained about having, I think it's like 500 kilobytes or something. No, bigger than that. Yeah. Your browser gets kind of torqued by that. Uh, some lessons from X11Perf. Uh, large batched operations are awesome. So when you draw a thousand dots, a thousand lines, you know, 80 glyphs, when you draw a thousand rectangles, GL gets, up, its, uh, gets uh, up a good head of steam and really plows right on through those primitives. Um, when you draw small operations, GL is a complicated library. And our current Mesa implementation has a lot of steps between me and drawing the first primitive. Uh, so the, the, the places here where we saw lines going to the left, is that really not going to go backwards? Oh, right, this is an SVG, and LibreOffice is like, no! So these lines to the left down here, where you see all the blue and green, those are windowing operations. And that's where the, ex that's where the test is, like resizing a single window. To resize an X window, the computations within the server are trivial. You adjust some clipping lists. But what, what happens on the screen is you paint two tiny little rectangles with a new color when you resize it. You know, you make it a little bit bigger, you paint a rectangle here and a rectangle here. Painting two rectangles takes almost as long as painting a thousand rectangles. So doing it in software is dramatically faster. Uh, the other thing, uh, there, there are some other operations like a few wide line paths, some wide arc paths, and polygon paths that end up being just, you know, you're going to paint a couple hundred primitives uh, with GL. And the uh, small operations, they just get totally swamped by the overhead of GL. I would love it if GL had like no overhead and I could just like blast stuff right into the hardware. Um, that's a lot of what SNA does, the SNA acceleration architecture. The problem with SNA is that it's coded at the assembly language level, and as a result, it accelerates very few actual operations. But the operations it does accelerate are scary fast, because it, it doesn't have this large abstraction layer between it and the hardware. So some perform, potential performance ideas to make this even better. Um, one of the ideas I came up with is, hey, I've got this queue of stuff heading for the hardware inside of Mesa. It doesn't actually get to the hardware until I, until I tell Mesa, hey, I'd like you to send that to the hardware now and flush it out. What if I just kept that queue up inside the X server and noticed that, oh, hey, I'm drawing another couple rectangles. Oh, look, I drew rectangles last time. Let me stick these new rectangles at the end of the list. That way I, get, I would get to amortize the cost of that one rendering operation across multiple primitives. Where this is going to really help is things like window operations and the all-important wide lines. Um, the other thing that, I, that I'm thinking about is uh, for, uh, for applications like GTK Perf, which do want to draw a few primitives in each color, or for applications that are painting a complicated web page where they're filling in little regions of different color and a couple, a couple glyphs here and a couple rectangles over here, they're changing these things that I think of as fairly static rapidly. And I'm using the uniform mechanism in GL to pass these into the fragment shaders, what if I pass them in as vertex attributes instead? What if I pass them in as essentially a per primitive attribute instead of a per operation attribute? Uh, would, that, uh, would that let me do more batching? Would that let me amortize the cost of the GL operation across more primitives? I don't know. Um, okay, so that was core X. Uh, then we also wanted to accelerate the render extension. Render was added to X in 2000. Uh, the reason I added the render extension was because I wanted to have any alias text. That was in an era when displays were about 96 DPI. Uh, with my 4K monitor at home now, I don't know if I need any anti-aliasing anymore. Um, I'll get that working in a couple months and we'll find out. Uh, there were some conflicting goals when we did the render extension. In year 2000, not too many people had competent GPUs. So we wanted to be able to satisfy the 2D rendering requirements in software reasonably efficiently. And we wanted to be able to perform well on existing hardware. 
Um, after we did the render extension, we discovered that actually using the render extension was an enormous pain for applications, so we built a new library on top of that called Cairo. So if you've programmed in Cairo, Cairo was invented to solve the problem of how do I draw graphics using a render extension. Oh, and also it works on Windows and Prints. Um, here's what render does. It has a three, three operands, essentially. There's a mask operand, which is a shape. as a source, which can be a solid color, a gradient, in a linear gradient or radio gradient, or it can be a, an image, of course. And then there's a thing to paint to. And so you take the mask, which kind of clips out a piece of the source and paints it on the surface. Pretty simple. Looks a lot like Core X, but instead of doing raster ops, you're doing compositing. Uh, the other special case we have for masks, um, you, can, you can compute a mask with just an image. You can actually ship up an alpha mask to the server and paint with that. You can construct geometry on the fly with trapezoids or triangles or rectangles. Or we have a magic special case for the important operation, any alias text. We have uh, uh, optimization for, uh, for painting glyphs fast. Um, those are the operations. You can either do a single rectangle, a bunch of glyphs, or some geometry. Uh, render glyphs are kind of interesting. Uh, the client creates a, a basically a bag of images. And you can throw as many glyphs as you want into this bag. And then when you're painting a sequence of glyphs, you can just pull glyphs out of the bags and put them into this big list and paint them on the screen all at once. So the glyphs operation is kind of the batch operation in render. Everything else is very much incremental and very small. Um, and that means that render is really conflicting with OpenGL. Because when you draw a couple of trapezoids, or you draw a single rectangle, you're not taking advantage of any of the batching. So one of the, one of the, one of the thoughts of doing that batching um, inside the X server was to be able to do render a little more efficiently, because it has almost no batching at all. Um, except for glyphs, and glyphs are a pretty useful case. Uh, Glamour uh, stores glyphs in a fairly straightforward way. Um, Glyph sets themselves are often bigger than the maximum texture size. If you have a font with 4,000 glyphs and they're each 40 by 40 pixels, that's a steaming pile of texture space. Um, applications, it turns out, often draw a single line of text from multiple fonts. So they usually use multiple glyph sets for that. So Glamour couldn't do the same thing for render text that it did for core text. I couldn't just create a giant texture and dump all the glyphs from a glyph set in and say go. So instead, what I do is I create a single cache, and I just paint the glyphs that I need for this time right into that cache, hand the whole thing to the hardware. The next time the text operation comes in, I say, oh, I have some of those glyphs in that cache already, and I need to add some more. We'll add some more. And eventually, the cache gets to be uh, painting the glyphs you have on the screen. Um, the other thing that I do is when, I, when, when the cache is full, you think of a cache as something you'd replace a glyph in. <laughs> Not with GL. The thing you don't want, desperately don't want to do is replace an image that you might be currently using in your, in your texture. So what I do instead is when the cache is full, I just say, pitch it. I throw the cache away, and I allocate a brand new one and start putting glyphs in that. And that works out. It's, the code is really simple. The performance is really good. And I don't fight uh, the way GL wants me to operate. Um, mostly, I don't stall the GPU when I miss. Uh, it's really simple to draw glyphs, make sure the glyph is in the cache, and stick the glyph uh, into uh, all the info in that into the list of vertices you're going to pass to the vertex shader. Uh, so future render work, that's the operation that I have currently accelerated. There's a pile more render stuff to be done. Uh, last summer, we had a, a GSOC student who promised to work on this. And Eric asked if I would work with a student and you know collaborate with him to make sure this work got done in a sensible fashion. And our GSOC student evaporated. So I kind of waited around for GSOC to start, and then nothing happened. Um, and I got uh, sidetracked by this stuff. Um, so we need to figure out, render has a lot of complicated sources. In Core X, you have solid colors, tiles, and stipples. In render, we have uh, solid colors and tiles, or textures. And we also have gradients. Um, so we need to figure out what to do with uh, render sources uh, to make it work the way that I did. Uh, for core stuff. I think it's going to be possible. The gradient computation is kind of tricky, so your fragment shader may get kind of ugly doing gradients. But I think it's important to make sure I do all the computation uh, on the GPU again. Need to add some compositing, composite code, and trapezoids maybe, and, and I hope this is all going to work out. Um, I have some infrastructure that I did for the glyph stuff. It looks like it's going to work out okay, but 
I don't have the code yet, so I have no real ideas. Um, measuring X performance. Um, we have this tool that measures X performance. It's called X11Perf. Um, it kind of misrepresents real applications. Uh, not too many applications draw a thousand lines at once, or a thousand rectangles. We used to have this really awesome system called Cairo Perf Trace that would trace the application, save the trace of the application, you'd replay it and get a good measure of uh, performance of that application. Um, the traces that we have are kind of old and stale. Um, Cairo itself is in kind of flux right now and I don't know exactly how well it's working. The other thing is that, that the Cairo Perf Trace replayer only draws off screen. And I have huge performance differences between on screen and off screen drawing and I need to know I need to be able to do both. Uh, we have GTK Perf, well that's an awesome performance measurement. Um, it shows how fast GTK moves widgets around. Oh, that's important. Um, that's kind of useless. Um, in the GL world, all your GL games actually have, many of them actually have kind of benchmarking mode built into the game. So here you have a real application that real customers actually really want to play and you have a way to uh, use that game to construct a benchmark. It's like, yes, actual benchmarking. Um, yeah, not so much in 2D land because 2D is mostly fast enough. Um, I'm not really worried about absolute performance, but I'm sharing this uh, thermal envelope of my CPU and GPU with all your application execution. So the faster your graphics goes, the more time I have to spend doing other stuff or the less battery I consume drawing. So the reason I'm interested in performance in this environment is not because 2D applications aren't fast enough, but because every joule I spend on doing graphics is a joule I've wasted, sucked out of the battery, and a joule your application doesn't get to consume and uh, heating up your lap. Um, GL versus X, sometimes it's not great. Most of GL is kind of like X, but sometimes there's a really mismatch. Um, texture formats. Uh, GL has these texture formats, X has PixMaps and Pictures, and Windows and Visuals. I've got a slide about that. Uh, there's a bunch of limitations in, in Glass that really suck and hurt a lot for X. And then there's older hardware. Uh, X PixMaps define only depth. Oh, I only have five minutes left. Um, um, and GL textures uh, only define the content. So they only tell you whether you have uh, red, green, and blue. They only tell you whether, you know, maybe it's an alpha only. They don't actually tell you how many bits per each field that you have. Um, and so you have X telling you how many bits you have and GL telling you what the data is in those bits. And in X, the way that you, you can take an arbitrary uh, PIX map and say, oh, now I want you to pretend that those values are RGBA. Or, no, I'm done using those as RGBA. I want you to take those same bits and pretend that they're just BGR. Uh, GTK does this. <laughs> Thanks, guys. So there's a bunch of frobdicating that Glamour needs to do in order to, to convert back and forth between these pixel formats um, as you change how you're using them. Uh, right now, we actually occasionally end up make a, in making a temporary copy of the image in a new format and hoping things go okay. Um, I really want to be able to use a new extension that GL has, uh, uh, texture uh, image storage and uh, texture... What? Texture views, yeah. Uh, ARB texture views. Um, and so I'm hoping to be able to take advantage of those. Right. Uh, there's some limitations in GLESS 2. Uh, GLESS 2 is what most of your embedded GPUs use, and I really want to be able to run X in those efficiently. It's missing a lot of the stuff that Glamour is currently using. It's, uh, Glamour, uh, X doesn't do triangles, those three-sided objects. X draws rectangles like real men. Um, the closest thing we have in GL is a quad, um, and so I use quads all over the place. Uh, GLESS doesn't have 32-bit uh, integers. I use those for uh, doing a lot of transformations. GLESS doesn't do instance drawing. I use those to pull X objects into coordinates. Um, and it, there's a bunch of texture format stuff that it's missing as well. Oh, and logic ops, but you know, again, any sane X, 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 X app is only using copy, so maybe we'll do some more fallbacks there. Older hardware, uh, to be specific, uh, Intel until last year was selling 915 and 945 hardware, which is basically DX9. Um, it doesn't have vertex shaders. Did you see those vertex shader programs I was writing that do all the complicated problem kidding on coordinates? Yeah. 
not so much on this hardware. So we actually, in the current Mesa driver, it executes those on the CPU, and they're really slow. Uh, Glamour performance in the 915 sucks. Don't do that. Um, I don't really know what to do. I don't want to, I guess we can keep the existing 915 drivers around? Yuck. Uh, we could fix Mesa. Who wants to sign up for that? Ooh, I have a, uh, a customer with a million 915s that will pay me lots of money to make Mesa go faster on that. Unlikely. Um, we could construct a new drawing-only driver interface, and it's like, yeah, well, you're not going to run GL on that. We're going to construct an all-new API for you. That seems like a winning plan. So I, that's a real problem. Um, question. With that question supporting all the hardware, would it help if you could throw in, you know, basically not support a bunch of the operations which are difficult to do without those features? Or so, are the, 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 those features, vertex changes and things like that, used so? Uh, used, uh, are the features like vertex shaders used so extensively in Glamour that you, you couldn't do it without it? So, so the question is, could we just not use uh, vertex shaders, for instance, which aren't, aren't supported this old hardware? And the answer is uh, no, uh, because the way Glamour works is it takes the X coordinates and converts them into the actual polygon coordinates in the vertex shader. So I could, yes, I could construct a new version of Glamour that worked like the old version of Glamour and did all those transformations in the CPU. But that would, that would mean essentially duplicating the entire Glamour stack again. So I'm really not interested. Really? What? You could just use the other oh, uh, Eric said you'd ask that question. So the problem with the other 915 driver is it's buggy. Yes, but that's and it's slow. It's, not it's actually slower for these operations than the classic 915 driver. Go for it. Did I mention that one of the uh, one of the solutions is to fix Mesa? Yeah. Have a good time. <laughs> Are you getting paid for that? Awesome. Yeah. Good. Uh, who's crap? Thank you. Okay. I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about the mode setting driver, but we don't have time. Um, and I wanted to talk about uh, Zephyr, but we also don't have time for that. But that's okay. Uh, mode setting is in the server. Uh, the plan is here to get rid of all of the drivers. I want to show you this next slide because this is kind of awesome. Uh, mode setting saves a bit of code. Uh, I'm literally taking 368,235 lines of code in the X server and replacing them with 5,032. <laughs> I think this is epic even on Ajax's scales. <laughs> yeah, so that's what I have to talk about today. Um, I'll be here the rest of the week if you want to ask me questions. I'm sorry I don't have any more time today, but thanks for coming very much this morning, and have a great time at the rest of LCA.